everybody. Jeff Katz back with you. Hope you're all having a good week or good start to your week, given it's a Monday, as we previously on Night Court. It was pretty sad to see the loss of uh, Marky Post uh, yesterday. Uh, we just lost Charlie Robinson from Night Court as well. I just actually happened to have just finished binging the complete Night Court within the last couple weeks. So it's been a Night Court season here. I uh, I would recommend a prime night court like when it, Reinhold Weege, the creator, and Linwood Boomer, who ended up creating Malcolm in the Middle, like when they were there. That era of night court is pretty damn good television. Uh, it, Cheers is the greatest sitcom of all time, but Prime Night Court really really good. Uh, and a show like if you don't offend easily, which in wrestling circles these days seems like that's an increasingly shrinking uh, demographic, but that, that's a separate conversation. But if you don't offend easily, uh, I would recommend Classic Night Court just for John LaRiquette uh, alone. But uh, a lot of great performers. Rest in peace, Marky Post and, and Charlie Robinson. And Harry Anderson, frankly, wherever you are. Well, he's, he's been passed for some time. We know, we know where he is. Uh, that's horrible. Anyway, we know where we are now. We're in the underground, and we've just seen the Crazy Joe Davola Fast and Furious. It's about family style entrance. As we see now, Mike Hayashi, he's doing his, is that his kata? And we're just basic. He's like, this is how I imagine, like, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, the teenage years. As he's attacked now by Blades, that's not Jay Youngblood. Uh, as you see, Renee Carbajal is Blades. Uh, Renee's a great guy uh, and a guy you know, I keep in touch with a little bit. He, he actually has in, is in, uh, I think, the L.A. area. And his, uh, when I was doing a lot of ESPN, I'd hear from him quite a bit because uh, I know he was listening. Uh, basically, if you were a Lakers fan, you were stuck with me for several years there for a while, which I, I'm a Pistons fan, which was great for me because I got to just piss all over them about uh, beating them in the finals twice. It was great. We should have had three, frankly. So here we go. Now we're going to take a look at Blades. And, you know, and as you see again, like the, the we've talked about this a couple times. From a costuming point of view, like in, in WRP, I went and I ordered special trunks for certain guys. Like, we, we you know, we had uh, Conan uh, and the folks at AAA hooked us up and got us the mask for Dio's Dorado that is currently on my bookcase. Uh, and, and in this case, it was the opposite. Uh, as we see now, the entrance is Stone, of course, Nick Jackson. Uh, and in both of these guys' cases, you know, they're generally speaking wearing what looks like you might wear almost in the old days, like when you would do an old school street fight in NWA or a bunkhouse stampede or, you know, pick your dusty created uh, concept. Uh, you know, obviously the idea of these sort of being a young underground, you know, sort of angsty, you know, CW style youth, they wouldn't have access to the gear. Whereas when you see when Chase Walker and Lord of War show up, they're still going to be their WRP incarnations because obviously they're coming from another corner of the same universe. And so now we see Stone taking it to Blades and obviously, you know, we're, we're several weeks in their duo. Nice cross body off the springboard. Again, we go see the, the great Rick Knox. I want to defend uh, Rick Knox once again from Jim Cornette, who I do like. Uh, if you did not hear the Jim Cornette tribute to Bobby Eaton, I actually stopped as I was doing a bunch of housework this weekend. Uh, and I listened to the entirety of that. That's tremendous. Really good. Um, emotional and a side of Cornette you don't nor uh, normally get to see. And, and it's pretty interesting that you, the, the appreciation and respect for Bobby Eaton's work has united people pretty much across the board that may disagree on everything else. He shouted out Tony Khan. He shouted out other good people. He disagreed. Like, like Bobby, that should show you how eternally respected Bobby Eaton was. Um, you know, whether you knew him as a guy, uh, which I'm not going to claim to have known him well, though I obviously interacted with him a bit. Um, but as a worker, knew him quite well. And, and, you know, everybody, you didn't have to work with him professionally uh, to understand how great a worker he was. Although it, it, it didn't hurt as they would say. Nice little clothesline there by Blades. Of course, that's not a lariat unless you're wearing cowboy boots. That's a wrestling rule. Uh, nor a Russian sickle unless you are a Minnesotan playing a Russian. That's another wrestling rule. I think anywhere in the Midwest playing a Russian or anywhere Eastern Bloc, we're going to old old school Eastern Bloc, we're going to allow it. Now that's very dirty. You know, okay, so I don't understand. That's a five count. They broke. Like all I ever hear about is that Rick uh, on Cornette is that Rick Knox doesn't break up five counts and stuff. I have to clearly see what I'm missing on this because as you can see here, 
Rick Knox doing like really tradition traditional, really good, really solid refereeing Blades work. For the cover. Blades very clean. Two count there. I, uh, you know, I, I've said a couple times, like I love Noxy. I'd hire him again in two seconds. Think very highly of him as a person and as a ref. Would say that about Sparky Ballard here who worked for us again as well. A big boot to the gut. Nothing nothing technical about that boot to the gut by Blades, but it does the trick. And, you know, we've talked a couple times about the idea that my booking philosophy is generally sort of keep it simple, stupid, A to B to C to D. Um, you know, there are times where you're going to want to show instead of tell, but in terms of, like, wrestling logic, you kind of you want the... the the overall arc, the checkpoints, if you will, along the Wait, arc to make to sense from a stone. continuity level and from, a, you know, and uh, just a larger storytelling logic level. And so in this case, obviously, we know that the heart and soul of the story already at this point is Stone and PW3 and Liz, obviously, in there. It's going to twist and turn in various directions, may not necessarily go where you think it might go, but it's, you know, not... Not going to overly surprise you, ultimately. Uh, and so, while it's not surprising, ultimately, where a match like this may go, uh, in terms of the match you're seeing now, in terms of the build for, for Nick Jackson, or for, for Stone, I should say, in this case. And by the way, I want to say, I may be misremembering this, there's a very bad Ed Norton, I want to say it's Ed Norton and maybe Robert De Niro, it's not, not the score, which is a, a pretty good movie. Frank Oz movie with Marlon Brando and Angela Bassett as well. But a movie called Stone. It was definitely Edward Norton. I don't remember who the lawyer was. I want to say it was De Niro. But where Edward Norton is playing like um, he's a, if you've ever seen True Romance where Gary Oldman's basically a white guy playing a black like Rastafarian uh, Edward Norton's playing like a, like a, a white guy who is culturally black. he's like Sean King, uh, Talcum X if you, if you follow that guy. Uh, in the social circles. Uh, I'm not a big fan of. Bit of a grifter. Uh, and that's come from someone who works in the you know, wrestling in Hollywood. Um, the but the idea, basically, uh, of Edward Norton is like a cornrows wearing, like, yeah, that kind of guy. His name was Stone. And I don't believe that this was inspired by that because I've never seen the movie. But I recall the trailer being entertaining. And, and that's a slight diversion. But now after I get done wrapping this up, I have to go watch the trailer for the movie Stone. Might have been a slight nod to that ridiculousness. Thankfully, we didn't make, wear, make Nick wear uh, cornrows or make him go, yeah, right yeah, yeah boy. Oh, Although I can't speak for what they're doing as heels My now. And now there we go, a little running knee. Has to go off the knee for the Shining Stone's Wizard, so we don't we don't count now. it there. A little double palm thrust, it's almost a, a Liger-esque variation, although not the upward palm thrust. And as we saw earlier, with Hayashi coming out, obviously evening up the score from earlier during the, the jump backstage, continuing that storyline. So again, pretty clear logic, not rocket science here, can be followed by an old school wrestling fan, new wrestling fan, teenager that's never seen it, that just says it's on awesomeness and it's for me. A little X-Factor-ish kind of a right springboard X-Factor type deal there, and Stone picks up the win. Underground crowd is excited. And obviously now you've you know you've kept the momentum for Stone going, and at the same time you've given Blades and Hayashi another place to go. Now wait a second. I, I just asked that question myself. Myself. It's a little trippy hearing yourself doing the commentary like a decade later and often saying the same shit you're saying now. I would like to think I've evolved creatively enough to speak slightly differently, but. But it must Appar be apparently not. And so obviously, as, as noted here, they're both 2-0. and You got Liz in the middle. And we've acknowledged they're brothers, I believe, at this point. Right in the middle. Uh, which I like also just because it's, you know, we and, and we did, if you look at the outlines that are posted up on the, the Creative Archive on Reddit, like we did the, go through versions where they weren't going to be brothers, etc. At a point, you kind of had to lean into it. And now there we go. Jillian doing a good job. And Noxy. Shout out to you, my friend. Don't li don't listen to, to Cornette. You're doing a good job, I'm sure. There are no rivalries like that between and so basically, yes, as we've acknowledged, they are they are brothers, and it gives it a little bit of an extra wrinkle, obviously, but done 
you know, with our own take on it, given the fact that this is its own little corner of its own sort of pocket universe. It's interesting now, you know, given the fact that between Marvel and DC, it's, you know, multiverses have gone so mainstream. It's not like reading, like, Crisis on Infinite Earths when I was a kid. Or I wrote a, a book for DC called Booster Gold uh, with Jeff Johns where we did a big, a big tour of the, you know, sort of the multiverses and such. Um... Uh, and sort of the time stream of DC. That stuff is so basic to audiences now at a modern level that I think, like, they, in some ways, they'd get it a lot more today. Uh, those check marks, I don't, I actually, I think we actually did leave those check marks. Those were not homegrown. This is like my murder count. Okay, and this is a big and important thing here because, you know, we, uh, this show may not pass the Bechdel test or whatever, but you do, Liz is not, you know, it's, this is a you don't own me situation here. Like, she's her own woman, she's a thinking woman, and ultimately, the fact that she thinks for herself and does what she, you know, she's strong enough to do what she wants is going to play a major role in ultimately where the PW3 and Stone storyline and relationship goes. And I think oftentimes women, you know, can be treated like eye candy in this stuff. Uh, this, these are obviously attractive women, but you want to give them stuff to do at a character level. We try to do that, obviously, with Aphrodite and Chase Walker and WRP. You're going to see Shayna go in a different direction as well with famous B here as Luther, as, oh, as, I, as I literally set up now. You know what King said. If you lose next and so, as you can see, like again, these are very almost teen melodrama, classic CW or old school WB, um, but done in the genre of pro wrestling so in the same way like if wrp is hbo or fx this is your your old school 90210 era fox